This is our Sunday School lesson number three from unit number one, Call to be Strong, for June 18, 2017. And the title of our lesson is Building Trust. Our devotional reading is from the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, verses 6 through 21. Our background scripture is Judges, the 11th chapter, and our printed passage is Judges, the 11th chapter, verses 4 through 11, and then 29 through 31. And our key verse is Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? And this is the NIV. Our lessons aims are acknowledge that people who have disagreements can unite to defeat a common foe. Feel remorse from alienating others. Discuss the importance of reaching a meeting of the minds on motives and expect, uh, expected outcome before accepting a leadership role. The introduction to our lesson today really summarizes uh, the real uh, significance or the real outcome of what our lesson is uh, driven towards or based upon. And I would like to read that aloud to you. Uh, the story of Jephthah's early life still happens today. He was born out of wedlock. The fact alone did not make him good or a bad person. He had no control over how he was born. Still, he was shunned by his own flesh and blood. G. C. Morgan shared very touching thoughts about how Jephthah was treated. To those who are willing to see it, the story of Jephthah affords a solemn warning as to the wrong of treating a child born out of wedlock with contempt. It is constantly done, even by excellent people, and it is wholly unjust. Here we see God raising up such a man to be a judge over his people and to deliver them in the time of grave difficulty. Now, our verses uh, at the beginning of chapter 11 of Judges uh, really sets the tone of how uh, Jephthah was uh, excommunicated or uh, driven out from among his people. Uh, his, the sons of Gilead, when they uh, grew and became adults, uh, they were concerned about the inheritance. And if you read verses 1 through 3 in the beginning of uh, the 11th chapter of Judges, uh, it gives us a insight into uh, how the brothers, after they were grown men, uh, how they began to view uh, Jephthah uh, when they began to focus on the inheritance that would have been given unto them uh, from their father. Uh, then they began to identify that uh, Jephthah doesn't have the same mother. He's not of our flesh and blood. Even though we have the same father, uh, we have different mothers. So he's not really... Uh, the same as us uh, because we have different parents. Now, uh, based on these uh, guidelines, and even though this is biblical, uh, uh, 
uh, and years uh, and thousands of years ago. Uh, these are still present day practices, behaviors, and attitudes of people today. And uh, just as we read in the introduction, a child that is born, as we say, out of wedlock, uh, born uh, by a woman just like those who are born in wedlock, uh, they have no choice in the matter. Uh, as none of us have had choice in the matter as to who our parents are. But people, when they begin to start thinking about the separation of goods, wealth, inheritance, all of a sudden they begin to try and use uh, different customs uh, now to distinguish who should get what. Uh, even to the point where I'm the eldest, I should get more. You're the youngest, so you should get less. I'm a male, I should get more. You're a female, you should get less. Uh, and then it also sets a tone as we begin the study of our lesson here. Uh, it, it sets an attitude as though because we don't have the same parents, that you are different than me, that, that you won't share the same thoughts that I do. You won't have the same values that I do. We don't believe the same things. Uh, we don't act the same way. As though all of us who are born to the same parents, all of us always come out the same, right? Because we have the same parents, we all think alike, act alike, believe alike, right? Uh, simply because we are from the same bloodline. That so we can just read into how ridiculous that is. So these are the types of things that have been set uh, in the uh, beginning of the lesson to give us more of an insight into how the people of Israel responded to Jephthah. And, and when we really think about it, if you read into the end of the 10th chapter of Judges, uh, if you read through that towards the end of it, you, you begin to see how that the Israelites have been just like yo-yos. They were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And every time God would send them a new judge and deliver them and then bring them back on the path, they would go right back to idolatry. And many times when we think about um, the uh, idol worship, we make association that it is some statue. It's some type of an image. It's, uh, uh, it's some monument or something that we're bowing down to. Uh, but idolatry is very present today, and it doesn't have to be an image. It doesn't have to be a statue. It doesn't have to be a monument. We're involved in idol worship today of people of some type of statue or recognition that we've given to them. And we're worshiping that. We're worshiping material things. We're worshiping money. We're worshiping status. We're worshiping uh, recognition. Uh, we're caught up into false worship. We're, we're, in, we're involved in things that make us feel good. So uh, our worship is not just based upon uh, imagery or things that we can see and touch. But our idol worship is deep-seated into our thought process, in our minds, in our belief system. And so we can remove ourselves from looking at Israel and just think what form of idolatry are we involved in? Now, as we engage into our lesson, I just want to read from the... Uh, 11th verse uh, in chapter 10 of Judges, just so that we can see this yo-yo activity uh, of Israel. 
And and then as we're reading it, think about all of the back and forward, back and forward activity in our lives. So the 11th verse in the Judges 10. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? Also the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Moanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned, no fooling. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. How many times has that statement been made? Just one more time, Lord. I swear this time, just one more time and and I'm over. I'm done. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Just as a backdrop, so as we enter into the lesson, we have a clear understanding of all of the drama and the dynamics and and all of the different factors that are at play here. So as we look at verses 4 through 7, we see that sometime later, and I'm reading from the NIV, uh, verse 4 says, Sometimes later when the Amorites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went out to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Now, I want to pause right there because there's a a moment of significance here. Uh, Because later we find out that uh, Jephthah was referred to as he was like uh, a a man of of vanity. He uh, he was kind of like unorganized, unstructured. uh, he he was considered to be just uh, among those who uh, made war and traveled and they were like raiders and they would just run in and, and take from others and then leave with whatever they could uh, steal or, or, or re- reap from the spoils of war. And so he was this man supposedly that... Um, You know, well, you don't want to invite him. Uh, That's why he was cast out, because we know he wasn't like us. And you can't you can't uh, figure him out. You don't know, you know, which way he's going to go and and uh, what his thought process is, his behavior and and so forth and so on. Yet the land that he was uh, driven to, told, is called in his translation, the land of good. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Amorites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Isn't that how we are? Uh, we're, We're quick and ready to say, Uh, let bygones be bygones when it's in our favor. Uh, Oh, forget about that. You're not still thinking about that, are you? Right now, I'm in a time of need. and, And the urgency of my relief doesn't afford me the time to really be indulging into the past, talking about what happened and what should have happened and what what would have happened, and and uh, we we do I don't have that luxury right now. Right now, I need your service, and I just need you to just do what I need you to do. But don't remind me about what I did. 
And so as we look at this lesson here, um, we, we have to get a understanding again of the people of Israel and the elders of Israel. Because now that they again find themselves in this trouble, and uh, now they realize we need some help. Uh, we need somebody who can come and fight these Amorites. Uh, because, uh, 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 I mean, uh, Ammonites. We, we need someone to come and, and uh, help us and assist us against this battle that we find ourselves against. And so now uh, they have already uh, exhausted uh, God, the true God. And so they now begin to reason among themselves, well, who can we call? Who, who should we look for? And so now the leadership begins to look for Jephthah because they remember he was a man of valor. And so now they say, let's call Jephthah. Uh, uh, he's a strong leader. He's a strong man. Let's, let's call him in and, and let's get him to assist us against the enemy. Now, there's a little controversy going on here. Um, in verse 5, we see that the elders of Gilead went out to Jephthah from, from the land of Tob. And they asked him in verse 6 to be our commander. Uh, help us fight the Ammonites. The Ammonites, I'm sorry. And then at the end of chapter 10... In verse 18, they ask him to be the head of them. But in verse 6, they ask him to be their commander. Now, there is a, a solemn or a sacred order here because God actually appointed the leader and the judges and it was not really left up to the people but in this case here the people feel as though they have gotten on to God's last nerve as we read in the, the verses of the end of Judges 10 where God said that he would deliver them no more. And God spoke and said, call out to all those other gods and all those other forms of worship uh, that you've been so attached to. See if they can deliver you. So uh, here they begin to now reason among themselves. And now we have the elders, those with insight and wisdom and knowledge. Uh, and then they begin to go out and they make an offer unto Jephthah to be the commander. But, but Jephthah realizes the history behind the selection of the commander and the head of the nation of Israel. And so as we get into the 8th through the 11th verses, look at how this drama unfolds then. So I'm reading the NIV. And the elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Now, again, remember, uh, they don't have the luxury of engaging into a, a long discourse about uh, what they allowed to happen and, and how they didn't intervene and do anything about it and, and how they just, uh, you know, went with the flow. This is what they want. And I know it's not right, but we'll go ahead and do it. So, but here their response is, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites. And you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Then Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? So there's some doubt right here in the wording of what Jephthah says. But remember now, 
Jephthah's uh, lived through already being betrayed and excommunicated and kicked out and isolated. And so Jephthah's like, and they did all of this because um, they, they said, well, you know, my mother was, was not a woman of virtue, you know. Uh, my mother was a, a harlot. And so when they didn't say nothing about uh, my father who, who laid with my mother, they didn't seem to think that that removed any virtue or credibility from him. But, but I was shunned because of uh, she wasn't his wife. And so then, of, of course, I'm a, of bad character because um, uh, she was just the other woman. And so when we look at this, um, we, we recognize that Jephthah realizes that there's a certain level of hypocrisy that rests within the elders and the leadership of Israel in their dealings with people that they've already uh, given uh, certain titles that, that uh, kind of excuse or, or give approval to the way that they behave towards them. So the elders replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. And Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord at Metzpah. And so uh, as we grow forward, Closer to the end of our lesson, I just wanted to uh, bring a couple of things uh, in, in, into sight here. Um, we notice now, uh, if you read uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, further in between the verses of uh, the 11th chapter of Judges, uh, if we read between 11 and 29, now, now, while Jephthah is supposed to be this kind of a uh, wild, uh, raving bandit, you know, that just runs in and he's a, a mighty man of war and he just goes and he, he dominates people and takes things and so forth and so on. Uh, but when we read from uh, 12 into uh, 28, we find out that Jephthah, before he uh, uh, begins to accept uh, this battle with the Ammonites, that Jephthah sends messengers out to the king of Ammon. And he, he enters into a discourse between his messengers and the messengers of the king. And he tries to employ uh, some, some uh, measure of diplomacy here. He tries to see, do we really need to enter into this battle, or can we talk and reason with each other, uh, and so that we can, maybe, maybe we can bypass this battle. Maybe we don't have to shed blood. Maybe we don't have to end people's lives. Uh, maybe there is a possibility that we can negotiate these differences. So he sent messengers out to uh, discuss with the king of Ammon, of Ammon and to um, uh, try to see, can we come to an agreement? Now, that sounds just like the behavior and the actions of a raving bandit, doesn't it? That, that he has the mind of counsel, that he looks into the situation before he just, you know, just jumps right at an opportunity to enter into battle. That he tries to uh, see are there other options that are available. So when we look here at the closing verses, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mespa of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites, 
will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now, as we look at this, let's put a couple of things in place. One is, is that what really caused Jephthah to be successful and to be the head of the people of Israel at this time, and, and if uh, memory serves me correct, I believe Jephthah served for uh, six years, I'm thinking. Uh, it says six or nine years he was the judge. Um, but what gave him the ability to do it was not just his own, his own capabilities, but it was because the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah enabling him to do the things that God wanted done at that time for his people. And so he actually, uh, he was ushered in under the spiritual presence of God to do what was needed at that moment for people who were at their wits end as to what shall we do now? And although they felt that they had chosen someone based upon the uh, wherewithal among themselves, the elders, uh, but actually uh, God was in the midst of that, choosing the man that he wanted to actually come in and resolve the matter that was before Israel, which they themselves could not resolve. And so uh, the spirit of God is what was enabling him and allowing him to perform this task and to be the head of Israel and to be their commander. It was not just his own abilities, but it was the abilities that were uh, bestowed upon him once the spirit of God was on him. And as a result of that, Jephthah was so overwhelmed by the presence of God being with him that he made a vow himself because of how overwhelmed he was and to show his sincere heart of what he, in return, wanted to give back to God for the blessing that God had bestowed upon him. And he says that whatever came out of his house when he returned from battle, that if the Lord had allowed him to win this battle, recognizing he couldn't do it by himself, but if the Lord would bless him to win this battle, that whatever came out of his house when he returned, he would offer that as an offering, a burnt offering unto the Lord. Now, there is some theological discussion uh, relative to um, the uh, sacrifice of his daughter who greeted him when he came back. But. If you read into the book of Leviticus, and I believe it's the 16th chapter, but if you read into the book of Leviticus, you will realize that the Lord decreed uh, that human sacrifice was not pleasing unto the Lord. And so therefore, uh, he would not have accepted uh, uh, Jephthah to execute his daughter because that was the practice of heathen nations who were sacrificing young children and women and men to the Lord. And so therefore he would not have accepted that from Jephthah. But this is a uh, discussion that is going on because his daughter came out to greet him in sacrifice. I mean, came out to greet him in celebration for what he had accomplished. So um, it requires us to read further into um, the lesson to understand the laws that were also uh, upon um, the people during that time. And uh, remember now, it was the spirit of the Lord that was upon him and the spirit would not direct or lead us falsely. 
So we hope that something has been said uh, in our lesson to shine light uh, upon uh, this uh, topic of building trust and uh, the whole scenario of what we engage sometimes in when we begin to start picking little pieces apart and making them bigger than life. As always, it is our prayer that the blessings of God will continuously be upon you. Uh, and for all of the fathers uh, who will tune in to our lesson, uh, we pray for you a blessed and fulfilled Father's Day and that you are indeed the men of God that God is calling for in this day and time. God bless you.